soft way. I feel um, that my own practice has actually got a bit of a uh, reboot, so to speak, and a bit of uplift just from being able to share the Dhamma in this lovely group and uh, taking the time in between the talks and in the evenings to meditate a bit more and in the mornings. So yeah, hopefully some of you also practiced already this morning. River's been very kindly holding the space um, for you. So by now, hopefully you've really settled in and uh, we've done quite a bit of work already together. We've been making peace with all kinds of phenomena in this um, curious mind-body world. So the first day we talked about making peace with the body and the breath, looking at attitudes with which we can hold these things in awareness in a very kind way and in a way that soothes and softens the clinging and thereby the suffering. And then yesterday we talked about um, coming in contact with our emotional world through those bodily sensations and through just that increased mindfulness and the sort of strength of mind and also the... Um, receptiveness of the mind which can start to open to our emotional world without stigmatizing any one particular emotion but looking at our emotions as sources of information which can help us to live a life aligned to our innermost values and uh, I was very happy that some of you did feel some sort of connection with your emotional world and and uh, somebody said they had a few tears as well which is really great and um you know, having emotions is not a sign of weakness, it's actually a sign of strength <clears throat> because you develop this kind of um, resilience and courage to just show up for yourself, yeah? So yesterday we tended to focus a little bit on the some of the more difficult or you could call them afflictive emotions um, and also thoughts and how our thoughts um, construct our world and also can build and intensify those emotions. And this was all quite, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to it. And there were a lot of methods that we covered as well, where we're actively working to um, find healthy relationships with our thinking process, um, learning to discern the unwholesome or the um, kind of thinking that leads to more suffering for ourselves and others and the kind of thinking that doesn't. And again, it came back to those three right intentions. So um, any thought motivated by ill will or cruelty or sense desire is basically going to obstruct the path to enlightenment. It's gonna cause harm for ourselves and others. And I'm sure we can all experience that within ourselves when we get stuck into a certain negative groove in our mind. But on the other hand, if we can notice when those thoughts are motivated by kindness rather than ill will, by gentleness, compassion instead of cruelty, and by renunciation, letting go instead of sense desire, then we are thinking in a way that's inclining our minds to freedom and peace. And another part of that sort of actually made the point that these kinds of thoughts are not compatible with each other. So anytime you're thinking a thought of kindness, it's not possible to be thinking a thought of ill will simultaneously. So we've been practicing some metta as well, where we intentionally bring up thoughts of loving kindness. And even if you're not feeling very much and you feel that, you know, the experience of metta is still a little bit unknown to you, um, you can be sure that while you're actually having that wholesome thought of loving kindness, you are cultivating right thought and those thoughts of ill will can't really find a foothold in your mind. So, you know, everything starts with our intention. And we're not looking for results. But if we keep on putting the energy, putting our attention into where we're coming from, into those right motivations, then we can be sure that we're on the path. And the Buddha said, you can know that it's the Dhamma, you can know that it's the Vinaya, the teaching of the Buddha, if it's leading to peace, to turning away Nibbida from the path of suffering, um, to dispassion rather than passion, rather than clinging, craving, desire. Um, to Abhinya, to deep wisdom, deep knowing, to Sambodhi, enlightenment, and Nibbana, cessation of all suffering. Yeah. So this is the kind of litmus test, whether or not we're in line with the Dhamma. Is it leading to those things or is it leading to more tension, tightness, clinging, grasping after sense pleasures or after um, even sometimes negative thoughts? 
um, thoughts of ill will. <clears throat> so not to judge, but just to notice how we use our mind and how that affects us. So we've also been rolling around three questions during this time for your investigation. And that is, what am I doing? How is it affecting me? And where is it leading me? Yeah. And yesterday I added one onto that, which is where is it? How is it actually motivated? Like, where am I coming from? Yeah. So where am I coming from? What am I doing? How is it affecting me? Where is it leading me? And in this way, we don't ask those questions cons consciously as thoughts, but we can um, just use them as reminders when we practice <clears throat> to learn about the mind. So in meditation, you can't go wrong when the whole purpose is to investigate how this body-mind is interrelate, interrelated. And, um, you know, there's no such thing really as a bad or a waste of meditation if we're always watching cause and effect, yeah? Even if the meditation has developed tension in you or you feel worse than you did in the beginning, you can look at why that is and learn about this law of nature, yeah, the causes for peace and the causes also for suffering. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so today, I wanted to look into more of those causes for peace and uh, how we can learn to make peace through developing beautiful qualities in our hearts. Um, so far, we've looked at kind of, um, uh, yeah, not really overcoming, deconstructing uh, the ways that we build suffering. But today I want to look at also how we can develop um, qualities that lend to that peace and that lead to happiness in our heart. Because the Buddha said that happiness is part of the path and it actually should be there the whole way. It's not that this path is full of suffering and then one day you'll be happy. No. The path is a path of happiness, ever increasing joy, and also a refinement of the very wholesome kinds of joy. So it might not be kind of like stars and flashing lights and absolute bliss all at once, although it can, <laughs> it can be that way, but it tends to be a kind of quietening of the mind and a, a development of a very beautiful, quiet joy in the heart that is sustaining and that is lasting and much more nourishing than any kind of happiness we can get through the senses. That's not to say that sense pleasure is in and of itself wrong or bad or evil, but just that it has these limitations. You know, we can become very dependent on it. We can even become addicted, of course, if we say addicted to food or addicted to drugs and intoxicants, or even just addicted to kind of distracting ourselves through music or films. I mean, it's not necessarily breaking the virtue, but it is creating a kind of dependency and sometimes a way of avoiding or distracting ourselves from what we're actually feeling in the moment. And as I said yesterday, if we continuously run away from you know, how we feel, especially any difficult emotions, it's like we've um, eaten our lunch and put the pots in the sink, but we haven't actually um, put them into soak. And that food starts to get caked onto those pots. And if you leave it for a day or two, it becomes really hard to get it off. So by meeting ourselves again and again, you know, we learn to, um, to kind of take care in a wholesome way of our inner world so that things don't build up. Yeah. Instead of just running after sense pleasures to distract ourselves. And so there's this very beautiful sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's number 139 for those who are taking notes to read later. It's called the Arana Vibhanga Sutta. And I find this incredibly beautiful because it's talking about the kind of happiness that is to be cultivated and pursued. So the Buddha said that basically the two extremes that he talks about that are not the middle way, the two extremes are any practices that tire, fatigue, even torture the body, yeah? So that's one extreme to be avoided, not to be pursued. And the other extreme is indulging, rolling in sensual pleasure, uh, sense desire. And this also is not to be pursued. He said they're both ennoble and lead to suffering. So we're not just saying it's ennoble, it's terrible. We're saying it's ennoble in the sense that it's not going to lead to um, enlightenment, right? Because something that's ennobling leads you to actually become that noble one, a noble person, in the sense that you've understood the four noble truths. Yeah, you've made, uh, you've seen through 
the illusion of a self. So in that sense, these pleasures just increase and uh, fortify that sense of self because they're very much about me and my, um, my pleasure, you know, my body, identifying very much with the body. But the Buddha said there's another kind of happiness. And this, sometimes people think that means it's in between the two, but actually it's not in between. It's not a bland thing or a blank thing or some kind of place we have to kind of, okay, I can have a little bit of cake, not too much cake, or I can, you know, wear myself out a little bit, but not too much. It's not that. It's actually that you're going in a completely different direction. So the two extremes go outwards like this, into the sense world. But the middle way, the middle path in this context, the path of true happiness goes inward. So it's not only between those, but it's in a different direction. And uh, in this particular sutta, the Buddha defines that as the happiness that comes from the mind. And he's referring here to the happiness of meditation. Of course, it's a gradual training. Yeah. And as I said um, in previous talks, um, we talk about contentment um coming from a life of virtue so that's another sutta <laughs> for those who are interested Majjhima Nikaya 51 and I think it's also in the Danta Bhumi Sutta 128 they're about the gradual training and the Buddha says that a result of living a virtuous life is that we experience a blameless bliss and that it leads to contentment it leads to a feeling of happiness which is closer to contentment so this contentment is such a beautiful thing and the contentment can help us let go, yeah? So contentment and letting go kind of whirl around each other and reinforce each other. When we're content in the moment, we can let go of concerns about the past or the future, yeah? When we let go, we have a deeper and deeper understanding of what contentment really is, yeah? So the two things go together. And contentment is this beautiful type of happiness that really wants for nothing. It's absolutely satisfied at ease and at peace with the way things are arising right now. Yeah. And so it allows us to let go of any expectations, any kind of unrealistic fantasy about perfection, which doesn't actually exist. Right. I don't know. I feel like we're, we're spun a kind of lie, really at least in Western cultures, I don't know about in Asian cultures, but um, less so I, from my own experience in India and Burma. Um, but all the music, everything, you know, it's like, oh, when I meet you, my dear, you are everything to me. I can't live without you. My life is complete and all this kind of stuff, you know, all these songs that, that we have that kind of just spin this completely fantasy world that doesn't exist at all. And uh, as Ajahn Brahm points out, you know, there's always in movies and stuff, you have all this uh, drama, but then it usually ends with <clears throat> the couple, often the man and woman, but it might be the gay couple or whatever, going off into the sunset, you know, and happily living happily evermore. But you never hear the stories of like the arguments starting around who's doing the housework and, you know, starting to see that, yeah, once that kind of um, aura of like bliss and intoxication actually through the chemicals that arise when you're in love once that starts to settle you know you see that person's conditioned habitual tendencies and they kind of feed into yours and you start triggering each other <laughs> so we never really talk about that <laughs> it always ends at the point of marriage or you know <laughs> so contentment is more realistic it's a lot more realistic about you know what we can and cannot expect from the world and uh, not only does it settle for something average but contentment actually means that things really truly are good enough you know that we we do lower our expectations but because of that we can actually start to see the beauty in what is already here yeah so during my retreat, I was meditating and sometimes I just noticed that I was looking or I was thinking slightly a step ahead. Uh, you know, the bliss maybe was starting to arise through quietening the mind. And then there's just this kind of sense of like, oh, I wonder what next, you know, even it's not a verbal thought, but there's just this like slight leaning into the future, uh, <laughs> kind of looking for Ooh, what might be next. And then I remembered the words of my teacher don't look for what's not there, 
look for what is there. And I was like, oh, yes, again, you know, just coming into that present moment. And so contentment really helps us to sink more deeply into the here and now. And again, it's that different direction. Contentment is not looking onward or outward or into that sensual world. It's looking in and it starts the movement of the path as an ingression rather than a progression. Yeah. So the more you stay with something, the more it opens up, first of all. And the present moment suddenly becomes alive with awareness. It becomes kind of, um, you start to see much more in there. At first, it's just a breath, but after a while, you notice the texture, you notice the sort of soothing quality, or you notice the rhythm. It can be anything. You might start to notice <clears throat> that the in-breath and out-breath have a different energetic quality to them. And then when the mind sort of gets into that groove with the breath, you start to make a companion of your breath. You'll notice that, you know, if you're not thinking about the next breath, you'll notice the whole breath. And you'll even notice that pause between the breaths as well. There's a slight pause between, you know, the out breath and the next in breath, the in breath and the next out breath. So we really start to move inward and the whole path starts to, to change. There's this really lovely analogy that, um, again, Ajahn Brahm comes out with. And I kind of experienced that a bit during my rains retreat. He says, you know, there's this like ancient story in the Buddhist texts about the river being so wide and we need to cross from one shore to the other, right? And it's this huge river. Sometimes it seems more like an ocean and we think, how can we ever get across? You know, how is it possible that somebody like me can actually, you know, start to let go of all my attachments, all my cravings and actually experience this unconditioned peace within myself? I have so many defilements. I have so many things wrong with me. And we always focus on the faults, right? <laughs> Actually, it's not true that we have so many things wrong with us, but they tend to get magnified in our fault-finding mind. And so what do we do? We have to get a boat. We have to get a really well-equipped boat. So we put all the qualities in that boat. We build it up with compassion, with you know, meditation, with mindfulness, with metta. <clears throat> and we think we have to go across. But Ajahn Brahm says it's, um, it's almost like when you actually realize that the way is not moving across, it's moving inward. It's like that river starts to narrow. It starts to become much um, thinner. And you realize that instead of just walking up and down the side of the bank, thinking, how am I going to get across? You start moving inward and you realize you just turn in a slightly different direction. And you realize that actually that river is just a step just one simple step and you're across it. And it sounds a bit weird. It sounds like, what's she talking about? Like, how can you kind of narrow that river? But really what we're doing is narrowing that place between where we are and where we want to be. And we're narrowing that through contentment. Yeah. So in the First Noble Truth, the Buddha says, one of the definitions of suffering that he gives is um, that suffering, as well as being life, birth, death, aging, everything in between, the existential suffering, there's also a psychological suffering. And that includes um, association with the disliked, separation from the liked, and not obtaining one's wishes is suffering. Yeah. It's very obvious in a way, right? When you're associated with something you don't like, you want to get rid of that suffering straight away. When you're separated from what you want, you know, I came to this meditation retreat and I wanted that in three days my mind would settle and I'd feel some energy, I'd feel more positive, but actually, you know, I'm still feeling tired and groggy. <laughs> so we're separated from what we want. But there's a really quick way to resolve that, which is being happy to be with what you have. Yeah, Wanting to be with this disliked, actually wanting to be there wanting to be with your anxiety with your depression wanting to get to know it yeah and then the disliked actually starts to turn into the liked it's really amazing through our attitude we actually start to perceive things differently so the quality of our experience the objects of our consciousness actually start to change you know the depression or the boredom might actually start to seem quite interesting Sadness might start to seem quite tender, quite poignant, something beautiful, melancholic in there. Yeah. And then we continue to give that sadness the 
kindness and the metta and it actually starts to change into a feeling of warmth a feeling of metta and kindness so we're no longer separated from where we want to be everything is right there in the moment the other beautiful thing about contentment is it allows us to stay present for longer with our experience as, as i said yesterday it's the antidote to restless desire restlessness the winds that just blow us off into the future or back into the past or just into some sort of fantasy world you know we don't want to be here we want to fantasize about something different so it's the antidote to that because it holds our awareness with the um, present moment long enough for it to start to open up and for us to start to see the beauty there yeah it's also of course the antidote to desire if you're content with what you have where is the need for anything more it's one of the best periods of my life i mean who knows there may be better ones to come <laughs> and maybe the next moment will be the best moment of my life right it's the only one i have but one period of my life when I can really say I experienced a lot of contentment was in India before I um, ordained, but I was on the path to ordaining and I was doing a lot of service in the meditation centers. It was basically my whole life. And I would just travel around with this small little backpack and, you know, very um, secondhand clothes in there. And I really didn't own anything. I don't even think I used deodorant or anything like that. I was pretty stinky, one of those stinky travelers. <laughs> but I started wearing the Indian dress, so I didn't look like a hippie. And I started to be sort of accepted really into that culture. Also because I had that beautiful connection, you know, with, the, with a purpose that meant a lot to me, to the meditation communities and people from all backgrounds and walks of life. And uh, I noticed, you know, that because my life had a purpose I had this really strong sense that I was here to practice the path and that this path would lead to the end of suffering and that I had my whole life ahead of me I mean I was 20 at the time I started meditating and I knew that I had my whole life ahead of me and I could prioritize the practice and there was such a sense of purpose there that I really didn't need anything material in the world of course I do respect that there are people who have nothing there are people in that country especially who live in abject poverty and I'm not saying that that is okay that's not okay we need our basic needs you know we need to have food that at least keeps the body alive and hopefully even nourished <clears throat> and I was always fortunate enough to just about make it you know in that way I'd have my fried rice the cheapest thing on the menu or I'd be fed on trains by Indian families, you know, and share their chapatis. <laughs> so I don't think I ever went hungry, <clears throat> but I didn't have anything excess to my needs. And, um, and I noticed that I didn't need it because the contentment, the wealth, the Buddha says contentment is the highest wealth, was within my heart. Yeah. So I didn't need to find meaning in the material world in quite the same way that that most of us strive to and that we're encouraged to, especially in the Western world, you know, get a, a better car, get a bigger house, and then you'll be happy. I can get into that with the monastery. When we get the bigger monastery, you know, when we get this beautiful place with land and you can all come and visit. <laughs> and then I remember, no, look, you know, you already have a place in Oxford. It's, it's big enough to have guests. It's just that we had the COVID this year. So unfortunately I couldn't invite you to stay. But we had got a whole lineup of guests, including one of my Bakuni sisters in Perth, and she was going to come over and spend three months with me here. So, you know, it is already functioning. It is already fulfilling the purpose of spreading these early Buddhist teachings and um, offering a place where people can come and experience a little bit, a little mini um, microcosm of the monastic life. <clears throat> so I have to check myself as well especially against any pressure to move ahead quicker or faster and get something bigger and better. And just remember, okay, what I have right now is already good enough. It's already absolutely fabulous, really, you know, considering we started from nothing. So contentment really helps us to see the beauty of what we have and, um, and makes us realize that we don't need quite as much as we think. Also, when we're grateful for what we have, we realize it's a lot more than maybe we've even noticed before. Sometimes we just don't notice the blessings in our life because we don't look in the right direction. Again, we're looking onward, we're looking elsewhere. 
So when this contentment helps us to overcome the hindrances, of course, this also paves the path into the states of samadhi, into those blissful states of deep meditation, because it's the hindrances that block our entry to those things. Yeah. The Buddha says that as long as the five hindrances are operating, one cannot experience the, the states of jhana. And when we do experience those states of jhana, the hindrances are knocked out. They, they've been overcome, at least for that duration. And even afterwards, they'll be weakened for a long time. And because of that, we have an opportunity to see things like impermanence, things like the pervasive nature of suffering, because it has to be understood paddy. It has to be understood completely in order to really um, make the breakthrough to stream entry. And also we see things like non-self. And one of the reasons is because these things aren't so threatening anymore. We have another resource in ourself. We have this beautiful contentment in our heart. So um, Ajahn Chah always used to say, you know, we meditate to let go of things, not to attain things. And uh, this is such a, an amazing piece of wisdom, you know, that we're actually cultivating contentment, which helps us let go. Sometimes we think, how do we let go? If we let go, we'll have nothing. But actually, we find that the more we let go, the more we can really appreciate what's there. So by developing contentment, it actually gives us the confidence and the courage to let go a little bit more. So I wanted to talk just about letting go and contentment in the context of the third noble truth as well, because the third noble truth is when we start to come out of suffering. So the last two days we've been looking more at suffering and the cause of suffering, but now we're looking at how that cause is abandoned. Yeah, abandoning is a big word in Buddhism. And the Buddha actually said that um, labati samadhi, labati chitta eka gata. it means if we make abandoning vosaga, letting go, if we make that the main inclination, then we easily um, come to this place of stillness, of samadhi, of one pointedness, chitta eka gata. Sometimes Ajahn Brahma and Ajahn Brahmali translate eka gata as one peakedness of mind because aga also means peak. Um, but it basically means the mind can remain so contented that anything that's not needed drops away. And we can go more deeply into this present moment with one object of mind, just with one object, one simple breath. And that fills the mind to such an extent that we remain, we, we get um, um, unified with that. And the mind becomes stiller and stiller as it settles. And an enormous amount of energy and bliss starts to arise in the mind simply because we're not wasting it by looking outside of this moment onto different objects that restlessness has come to a stillness a stilling in our hearts so there's no restlessness so the third noble truth then in brief is is about abandoning and it gives four different ways of letting go um, so you can see this as you know abandoning suffering or you can also consider it as the cause for happiness what causes happiness Right. So the third noble truth, abandon suffering. The result of abandoning suffering is happiness, contentment, deep inner peace. Right? Well, the subject of this uh, whole retreat has been uh, making peace, being at peace with experience. So this is how we do it. And the first one that the Buddha talks about is called chaga. So there's four different ways of letting go. The first one is chaga. And that is translated literally as giving, giving. You also find this in the suttas when the Buddha talks about chaganu sati. It's called recollection of one's goodness, recollection of one's giving, one's virtue, because virtue is based on giving. It's based on generosity, isn't it? Really, it's a generous thing to be kind and to abstain from harming another living being. So giving, what does that mean in the context of meditation? This is one of my favorite methods, and I see it as giving my full presence to this moment, really giving of myself, giving all my love, giving all my care, all my attention, just to this one moment, whether it's one moment of the breath or, you know, one moment staying present with something difficult. I just give everything I have to that moment. So I'm, it's, again, going against the idea of getting going against the idea of meditating to get something for me. Instead, what can I give to this moment? 
sometimes it's nice to imagine that, you know, especially if you're going through a storm and you think you can't meditate and maybe, you know, your meditation, your mind is all over the place. You think, well, never mind. I'll just give, I'll dedicate this meditation to the Buddha. I'll just give this session to sit in the presence of the Buddha, so to speak, or in the presence of love or in the presence of anything you hold dear, you hold, you know, to be exalted, to be noble. For some people that might not be the Buddha, for me it, it is, and also any teacher who I've come in contact, but really anything that the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha represent, because these aren't only physical objects, these are, I mean, Dhamma is not a physical object, but these are also representing qualities of the heart. So we just give for the sake of that. We give for the sake of giving because giving is a beautiful thing to do. Another thing I love to, um, to incline my mind towards with the attitude of giving is giving trust to the breath, giving my trust to the breath. So the breath has entered the mind and now I've, I've allowed my mind to open up to that breath. And once I feel that, you know, that's fairly steady, I just give my trust to the breath. You take over from here, you know, just let the meditation unfold. I don't need to hold the breath. Rather, the breath can hold the mind. Yeah. See how this is different. You actually give your mind to the breath. You give all your love, compassion, presence, etc., to the breath. And it's just very subtle. I mean, it's not like you're really doing something. It's just reframing your perception slightly. And it can really create almost like a quantum shift. Again, it's like the meditation stops moving onward. You stop sort of seeing that there's this massive river to cross and you start just bringing it in. And that whole gap, again, the, the breadth of that river just narrows down. It's just a simple step. There you are with the breath right now. You've just given to the breath. So, and that's the whole thrust of the path, generosity of body, speech and mind. You know, it's all about giving away, giving away. So the next way of letting go is called patinisaga. And that is very similar to the word vosaga. All these aga words are from the same root. They always mean a kind of abandoning, a letting go. Sometimes the word abandoning can seem a little bit like, ooh, especially if we have abandonment um, issues, you know, it can feel a bit. But think of it as abandoning anything that's no longer serving you, anything that's not good for you, any self-limiting, um, self-critical talk or views, yeah, any ideas of I can or can't do this, you give that up. So you look in the mind in, in the beginning of your meditation, and you can actually ask yourself, you know, what can I let go of? I usually do that when the mindfulness is established a bit and it just came to me spontaneously on my retreat. I just find myself asking this question, what can I abandon? Because there's always some subtle holding there. You know, maybe you're clinging too tightly to a pain or an ache in the body. Maybe you're, I don't know, clinging to the last meditation or where your meditation is going in the long run. And you just realize I don't need that. I can unburden myself, I can just put this down one of the things that most of us I'm sure this year have had to abandon is plans right ah, every time we make a plan it's thwarted and it's just sometimes much more suffering actually having made it and having to let go of it than not making the plan at all <laughs> so pretty early on I decided I'm just not gonna I'm gonna almost not in a negative way but in a way just consider that in this year nothing much is going to happen so straight away, we had to abandon Ajahn Brahm's tour that had been about a year's worth or two years worth of planning for me, um, trying to get the venue, uh, you know, the dates and the prices and everything worked out. And then organizing all the talks in between. There was a full, I think, about 13 days worth of a program. And obviously, where we're going to stay overnight, who's going to cook for us, blah, blah, blah. How are we going to get from A to B? So masses and masses of correspondence with the venues, with the volunteers. And yeah, I realized pretty early on that that wasn't gonna happen. Uh, and we just had to let go of the whole thing. And Ajahn Brown's the eternal optimist. So he kept saying, yeah, maybe it can happen. Maybe it can happen. But I just wouldn't go there because I knew it wouldn't. And I knew it was more painful for me to think that it might happen and then get kind of knocked back again than just to accept that, okay, not this year, you know. 
And so, yeah, I held out a little bit of hope for a while that I could get to Australia for my Rains retreat. But again, I quickly realized, I don't know, maybe by March or April, maybe that that wasn't going to happen. Maybe but only by May, because we were still thinking they might open the borders, but obviously it didn't happen. And uh, actually, it was a sort of relief every time I put down the plans. And I also had to put aside this idea that I could only progress in my meditation with my Rains retreats in Perth. I actually thought that. I actually thought, you know, unless I have my Rains retreats every year in Perth, then I won't make enough progress to make this monastic life worthwhile because I'm just so busy, you know, with all the admin and the background work and the running of the charity. It's just not going to happen, you know, unless I have those three months with my teacher. But in fact, when I looked at it a different way, I realized that I had everything I could wish for right here. One of the beautiful things was that Ajahn Brahm agreed to talk to me every week. We have a whole hour together on um, just to talk about anything and everything and practice and the project for an hour a week. And anyone who knows his schedule knows that that is a lot of time and probably a lot more than most of his monks even get. You know, but he did that because he knew that I'm alone here without any other monastics. And um, just having that regularity is so reassuring for me. And so during my retreat, um, whenever I'd think, oh, it's a shame I'm not in Perth, I just look back and think, gosh, 11 years ago when I first heard Ajahn Brahm's talks, I couldn't have even dreamed of being in a position where I have my own little place. You know, I could have complete solitude in my home country and have personal interviews with Ajahn Brahm every week. I mean, I just wouldn't have even envisaged that. So I looked at it in a different way, you know, completely reframed it in my mind. And I actually found that that retreat was one of the most contented periods of my life, I would say. Yeah, just waking up daily, having nothing to do. It was the summertime as well, so beautiful light mornings, light evenings. And having no one else's energy to take care of, which for me as an empath is quite, um, quite nice <laughs> I do love people this is the thing but because when people are around I tend to look after them and kind of get really quite concerned for them and make sure everyone's okay which is great to an extent but for my retreat it was just so amazing not to have to think of that at all and to be able to turn that energy on me and say okay what do you need right now you know what would you like to have for lunch what would you like to um, do now or you know, are you having enough exercise? And I found that my whole internal dialogue or monologue just changed into a monologue based on loving kindness and care. And it was so lovely. I just didn't want to go down any negative paths in my mind. I'm not saying that there were no struggles at all. Yeah, I did have a week or so, or even a bit longer, where there was a particular theme that was really sticky for me and I couldn't let go of for a while. But in the end, I think my um the only method that really worked there was just to kind of not give it too much importance so yesterday we talked about sort of ignoring or forgetting so okay it's there but it doesn't mean uh it's that important and perhaps there is no resolution so just let it chatter on so that's what i did and eventually of course all things pass so throwing away throwing away our expectations or even our knowledge about meditation when we come into the sitting you know we might come into the sitting thinking right so I've got to get onto the breath and then I have to check is it a shorter or a long breath um, am I with the whole length of the breath and then what's supposed to happen oh now we're supposed to be calming the breath forget about it <laughs> just forget about it that's knowledge that's not experience so if any of these instructions will be helpful for you, they will present themselves at the right time. You know, you'll be meditating, you might find you're distracted and suddenly you'll notice, oh, I'm breathing in a long breath. Might not be verbal, but you'll just notice there's length to the breath. There is length to the breath. <laughs> that simple, right? There's also texture, there's also depth, but there's also length. And, and then the mind will just get that little bit of interest in the breath. So you can put away that knowledge and just allow the process to unfold. And, um, you know, the Buddha gave 84,000 discourses and he did that because people are different. People are so different. And, you know, he didn't always get it right either. Sometimes he gave an instruction that didn't work for people. But he gave those instructions because somewhere in there, there'll be something that will help. And in those days, I mean, people didn't get access to all 84,000. They just got access to maybe one, right? 
like he gave a teaching to the first bhikkhuni and it was all about um, knowing which way you're going in the meditation. So if it's the Dhamma, then it leads to, um, yeah, disentangling yourself and uh, similar things to what I talked about before, but a few more were included in there. And that was all she heard, you know, and then that was enough for her to just go off to the forest. And I'm sure, I don't know the exact story actually in her case, but with most of the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, there was a good while of struggling with the practice, you know. Some of them were enlightened within a couple of weeks, but some of them, it was 23 years and they hadn't had a moment of peace, you know. So they would take these teachings and they'd be guides for them, but they basically have to discover what worked for themselves. So we throw away our knowledge, we throw away, <clears throat> at least for that moment. And it's in there. It's not like you're throwing it away and you're going to lose it. It is in there. This is the point with planting seeds with all these talks. So it will come when you need it. So the next one is freeing, freeing, mutti. And it means freeing ourselves from anything, again, that we don't need. It's just a slightly different way of saying abandoning, right? But in this case, we're focusing on freedom. What is real freedom? Is freedom getting whatever we want? Or is freedom actually wanting for nothing, wanting for very little at all? Yeah. So we're free from desires. And that freedom is overcoming clinging. It's overcoming attachment. And then the last one is called analia. And this is a very beautiful one. It means like um, having no place for things to stick. Yeah. And this happens obviously when our sense of self starts to dissolve. There's nobody in there who can get um, offended or overly affected by praise or blame. Somebody says harsh words or kind words even, and it just doesn't really stick. You hear it, you acknowledge it, but it doesn't create a turmoil in the mind. Yeah. Even praise can be kind of tumultuous because once you hear the praise, you want to hear it again and again. And next time you hear an insult or criticism, it might be even worse <laughs> than it would have been if you'd have received some praise. So um, in the suttas, there's uh, all kinds of stories about, you know, how to overcome um, negativity or abuse. Um, and one of them is just by this Brahmin who basically comes to the Buddha full of abusive words. And the Buddha just says, um, oh, so say someone comes to your home and they offer gifts. What happens if you don't accept those gifts? And then the Brahmin's like, what are you talking about? Recluse, you shaven headed, good for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, what do you mean they don't accept your gift? Well, if they don't accept your gift, it stays with them. Anyway, you know, you're ruining our religion, blah, blah, blah. And he carried on with his abuse. And the Buddha said, just in the same way, Brahmin, I don't accept your gift of abuse. It remains with you, it remains with you. <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily recommend you say that to somebody, but we can have that attitude, right? We can just understand that if that person is coming with their negativity, with their anger, wanting to hurt you, wanting to harm you, it actually is their um, suffering that they're trying to project onto you. It's not really about you at all. It's about that person. They may be having a bad day. Something may have happened, you know, that you're not aware of and they might actually need some compassion. So uh, sometimes we have to have our boundaries, but also if we do have to avoid that person and stand back from that person in our own way, we can then practice compassion towards that person, you know, and not take it personally. And then there's a little um, sutta in here. I'll just read out a little bit because this is, I think quite practical and something that happens to us all the time, right? The ways we're addressed by speech. So the Buddha says here, okay, for the Sutta people, this is Majjhiminikaya number 21. So the Buddha says, I'm gonna call it community because the word monks is always used. Community, there are these five courses of speech, five ways of speech, that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with harm or with good, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Okay. Herein you shall train yourself. Our minds will remain unaffected 
and we shall not utter no bad words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. So that's the equanimity and the compassion, but then further he continues, we shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with that person, that's interesting, we shall abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is how you should train. So that's an interesting sutta also because it's, you know, giving us some very practical things to train in so that we're not affected by that um, harsh or untimely speech. But also it's interesting because usually with the meta practice, we start with ourselves and then we go on to the love person. But in this sutta, it's saying starting with this person, we practice loving kindness. So that's just a little tip as to how we can overcome anger. And I think the reason the Buddha says it here is because to stop that, that anger that we might generate in response from turning into resentment. So in a way it's to protect ourselves, right? So this is abandoning. And um, yeah, I sort of want to close here because, oops, I have gone over time, but I don't know. There's one more story about speech and about praise and blame and it's quite amusing i'm wondering if anyone would like to hear a story yeah okay it's a little bit of a naughty slightly cheeky story but um it's funny as well so this is from opening the door of your heart which you may know and many of you might know this story but i thought it's a nice one to end on <laughs> okay so the name of this story is abuse and enlightenment by Ajahn Brahm. Experienced meditation teachers often have to deal with disciples who claim to be enlightened. <laughs> One of the time-honored ways to test if their claims are true is to abuse the disciple so grossly that they end up getting angry. As all Buddhist nuns and monks know, the Buddha clearly stated that one who gets angry is certainly not enlightened. A young Japanese monk strenuously intent on Nibbana in this very life, was meditating in solitude in a secluded lake island hermitage near a famous monastery. He wanted to get enlightenment out of the way early on in his life so he could then attend to other things. When the monastery attendant arrived in his small rowing boat on his weekly visit to deliver supplies, the young monk left a note requesting some expensive parchment a quill and some fine quality ink. He was soon to complete his third year in solitude and wanted to let his abbot know how well he had done. <laughs> the parchment, quill and ink arrived the following week. In the next few days, after much meditating and pondering, the young monk wrote on the fine parchment in the most exquisite of calligraphy, the following short poem. The conscientious young monk, meditating three years alone, can no longer be moved by the four worldly winds. So those worldly winds are the winds of praise and blame, fame and disrepute, pleasure and pain. And there's another one that I always forget. Hmm. Gain and loss, gain and loss, I think. Surely, he thought, his wise old abbot would see in these words and in the care by which they were written that his disciple was now enlightened. He gently rolled up the parchment, carefully tied it with a ribbon and then waited for the attendant to deliver it to his teacher. In the days that followed, he imagined his abbot's pleasure at reading the brilliant poem so meticulously inscribed. He could see it being hung in a costly frame in the monastery's main hall. No doubt they would press him to be an abbot now, maybe of a famous city monastery. How nice he felt to have made it at last. When the attendant next rode the small boat to the island to deliver the weekly supplies, the young monk was waiting for him. The attendant soon handed the monk a parchment 
similar to the one he'd sent, but tied with a different coloured ribbon. From the abbot, the attendant said tersely. <laughs> the monk excitedly tore off the ribbon and unfurled the scroll. As his eyes settled on the parchment, they grew as wide as the moon. And his face went just as white. It was his own parchment. But next to the first line of exquisite calligraphy, the abbot had carelessly scribbled in red ballpoint pen, fart. <laughs> to the right of the second line was another, another ugly smudge of red ink saying fart. The third line had also another irreverent fart scrawled over it. And so did the fourth line of the verse. This was too much. Not only was the decrepit old abbot so stupid that he couldn't recognise enlightenment when it was in front of his fat nose, he was so uncouth and uncivilised that he'd vandalised a work of art with indecent graffiti. The abbot was behaving like a punk, not a monk. It was an insult to art, to tradition and to truth. The young monk's eyes narrowed with indignation, his face flushed red with righteous anger and he snorted as he immediately insisted of the attendant, take me to the abbot immediately. It was the first time in three years that the young monk had left his island hermitage. In a rage, he stormed into the abbot's office, slammed the parchment on the, on the table and demanded an explanation. The experienced abbot slowly picked up the parchment, cleared his throat and read out the poem. The conscientious young monk, meditating three years alone, can no longer be moved by the four worldly winds. Then he put down the parchment, stared at the young monk and continued. Hmm. So young monk, you're no longer moved by the four worldly winds, yet four little farts have blown you right across the lake. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. <laughs> this is the danger of attaching to so-called attainments. <laughs> so we meditate to let go. And as my dear teacher told me for my men's retreat, make contentment your goal. That's a really safe goal to have. Good. So that was a longer talk, slightly longer talk. So. We might go over by 10 minutes or so, if that's okay. Is it okay with the group also, with the um, organisers, if we end at 11, say? Is that okay? Because normally we end at quarter to 11. Yeah. All right. Because I want to do half, uh, I want to do 25 minutes meditation and then I want to uh, show you something. I'm not sure if our Californian people are here, but I'll show it in the morning and I'll show it again in the afternoon. It's our beautiful statue, of course. Yes, Karen's there, wonderful. Okay, <laughs> very early morning for Karen in California. Wow, she's eight hours behind. So please have a stretch. Stand up if you need to. Have a sip of water if you need to. Within a minute, we'll get into our meditation. So closing your eyes, wiggling about, rolling the shoulders, stretching the back, giving your ankles and shins enough space so they're not pressing into each other. 
Letting out the worldly wind. <laughs> Luckily, it's coming that way today, not the other way. <laughs> and just with your eyes closed, sensing how you feel now. Understanding it's all welcome, even tiredness, fogginess. It really doesn't matter as long as we can make peace, establish a good relationship with our mind. We need a lot of different experiences in order to really learn to make peace. So. And again, with your eyes closed, checking through your body. welcoming your body into this space and asking, is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable or at ease? And when you ask that question, listening with your inner eye, so to speak, listening into the body for any response, Spreading your kind awareness through each and every part of the body. As though the warm sunshine was shining on every, every part, every feeling, every cell. Soaking right through. illuminating and also relaxing and putting you at ease. Noticing if there's any tightness or holding that you don't need. Even imagining those parts expanding slightly to take up, inhabit more of the space in your room. Really inviting your presence to inhabit the space around you. And to be held by the earth. Surrendering to gravity, whilst also feeling the space above, perhaps extending the spine a little bit and top of the head, very gently reaching into the space above, as though you are hanging from a string. Noticing any tightness or holding in the breath. Just allowing the breath to flow freely. Being breathed.
So to start the meditation, I'd like to invite you, if you wish, to imagine that you're in a place, perhaps a real memory or an imaginary one, where you feel absolutely content. Maybe a time in, in your own life. Perhaps your childhood. On a sunny afternoon with nothing to do. Nowhere to go. Just being in the moment, carefree. A time when you really felt content or imagining a time where you feel content, what would that look like? See if you can create the scene in your mind. where it is, what time of day, whether it's warm or cool, whether it's outside in the nature or maybe indoors, in a meditation hall or in your room. time when there was nothing burdening you, no pressures, no expectations at all. Notice how your body feels. At this moment, there's no thought of the future, no concern there at all. No regret about the past. You're satisfied, at peace, and at ease. Everything is just good enough. doesn't have to be perfect. What a relief. And you notice that each moment is so valuable, so complete. There's no need to go anywhere else.
Thoughts may still come and go, like gentle clouds in the sky. But it's not a problem at all. Everything is just the way it has to be. They arise, they pass due to their own causes and conditions. Are there any visitors, are there any guests? Will you stay deep in this moment, giving all your care, your time, your love, Giving your whole life just for this one moment now. The only moment we ever have. Soon you start to notice the silence. The space between my words. Very gently, you make friends with that silence. Trusting the truth beyond the words. And staying at home in this present moment, not moving outside, you might find that the breath comes to visit you. If the breath comes in, Welcome it without demanding it stay.
If it wants to leave again, that's fine. You're content. See if you can give your kindness to the breath. Give your trust to the breath and allow, allow the breath to gently hold the mind. bringing you more and more deeply into the center of time. Just this part of this one simple breath. Nothing to do. Nowhere to go. Just making friends with the breath. Letting go of anything you don't need right now, which is not connected to the breath or to contentment. Trusting that the breath is enough. I'm just as content if the breath disappears. Whatever arises, just making peace.
Noticing if the quality of contentment carries any warmth, subtle pleasure, ease, happiness, even bliss. Can you also be content not only with the suffering in the mind, but also with the happiness, with the bliss, allowing yourself to really linger and enjoy the peace. the happiness of a contented mind, however subtle that may be. So now we have to gently invite you back into this place where you're sitting. Into your body. And just take the time to spread loving awareness throughout the body with a sense of gratitude. To your body for allowing you this time. For being healthy enough so that you can meditate. And learn the practice of contentment and letting go. No matter what condition your body or mind is good enough for now. So in your own time, gently opening your eyes. And I did promise to introduce you to my beautiful new arrival, the statue of the Venerable Arahat Bhikkhuni Patachara. It's a very beautiful wooden carving that uh, was offered to our little Vihara here, all the way from Bali. So she arrived two days ago and she's been wrapped up <laughs> to in, but I think she's doing good and um, there's no obvious cracking in the wood. Um, it's a very beautiful statue so she's been sitting next to me but I'm going to just um, turn my video off for half a minute while I put her in my place and then I'll turn her the video back on and see if, <laughs> see if it works.
I think you should be able to see her with a slight adjustment of my um, screen. So I'll put her there now. Okay. So I'm just disappearing for 30 seconds. Please don't go if you would like to see this beautiful, inspiring statue. And we can keep the recording, yeah, actually, unless it's stopped, it's fine. Oh, here we are. Is that okay? Can you see? <laughs> so, here she is. <laughs> Shall I turn her a little bit? She's quite heavy, actually. Yeah. There you can see the beautiful face. Turn her a bit more as well. You can see her from all angles. See that lovely carving? I don't know. Can you see it better like this? Maybe. Mm. Mm -hmm. There she is. If anyone wants to, um, it would be nice to hear your reaction, but if you want to write anything in the box. Anyway, I will bring her back again later, maybe as well. And I think, oh yeah, we're having our lunch now, aren't we? Having a walking meditation. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad you find her serene. I find her very serene. And it's a very special word. It's hibiscus. A hibiscus tree. So it's very pale. I wonder if I can show more clearly like some of the wooden detail. You see how it's got sort of grey streaks in the wood. That's one of the characteristics of that wood. There's her face more clearly. Very beautiful. Hmm. So there she is. <sighs> yeah, the person who, um, the place she came from, the proprietor hadn't wanted to actually sell her, so she put her on the website for quite a high price because actually she didn't really want to let her go because it's such a special one. Um, but then when we expressed our interest, she was so happy that it would come to a bikini monastery that she made a major reduction and didn't take basically any profit. She for good for for went all um, profit and we just and then all these because it was an American organization who like um, sells them from Bali um i put a post on facebook and sort of said if anybody would like to contribute and um, quite a few people in america some who, of whom i don't even know they um they basically offered her so about five people and they sorted everything out and yeah amazing <laughs> even this fabric was offered as well for free and also another one 
they're very old um, fabrics. One's from Thailand and one's from Cambodia, and I'm not sure which is which. But that was a, a gift as well for the monastery. So, yeah, we're sharing we're sharing the screen now, Patanchara. <laughs> so, um, it is time for some walking meditation now. And if anybody wasn't here with us yesterday, um, this is just a nice opportunity to carry on bringing that um, quality of being at peace with experience into the walking posture. And through the walking posture, you can come in contact with all sorts of sensations happening in your legs and in your feet and really learn to take that meditation into different um, activities in your life. So if you do want to uh, spend half an hour or so doing some walking, um, you can just choose a stretch of room or hopefully of your room because it's probably quite cold for most people outside. Um, but you can do it outside, wrap up warm and go and find a park and just be aware of your feet moving. Yeah. So the idea is just to help bring us into presence and into a connection with our bodies in this moment through the walking posture. So that's the invitation and we're going to meet again at half past one. Um, and we will have some discussion at that time on metta, loving kindness, probably my favorite subject uh, because it's the last day of the year and it'll be nice to um, to practice some loving kindness as a way to gently let this year go. And um, yeah, I gave an invitation yesterday to everybody here to um, think about some resolutions, not really resolutions, I've got three questions anyway for you. And if you want to reflect on these, you're welcome. And then bring them, bring your reflections to the session at, uh, uh, 3.20. So you've got a bit of time to think about it. And at 3.20, if you wish, we can share some of these together. I guess I'm going to have to make some as well, right? Otherwise it's not fair. <laughs> so what I suggest is that you write down something I'm grateful for. Something I'd like to abandon or let go of. and something I'd like to develop or bring forth. Is that okay? Do we need to put them in the chat box? Shall I say them again? And if, it, if you don't follow this particular formula, it's fine. I mean, you know, I just thought it gives a whole range of things, but you might wanna say something else. Something I'm grateful for, something I'd like to abandon or let go of, and something I'd like to develop or bring forth. And I guess the first one, something I'm grateful for, I'm thinking sort of in terms of this year, really, in terms of this year, because it's been a very difficult, tumultuous and unpredictable year for everyone around the globe, depending on, you know, uh, different circumstances but there's still always so much to be grateful for and for some of us I think that's becoming increasingly clear simply because we've had to look for the blessings you know so um, something I'm grateful for something I'd like to abandon and something I'd like to develop bring forth in the new year into the new year and into your life okay oh thanks River that's wonderful She's actually put it in there with really beautiful, everything's spelt perfectly. It's just so nice. Lots of care and attention. <laughs> Good. So we're going to close this meeting over the lunch period. Um, and you just use the same link to get back in again at about 1.20. Yeah. So we're welcoming you back at 1.20. And please enjoy your cooking and...